starting in verse 19. And Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye of the lamp, the, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us today um, as we continue our series in uh, Jesus is Greater Than. Um, let me just say, I, it's such a pleasure to be able to worship with you. I'm, I'm here in the front row trying to get rid of the tears out of my eyes before I walk up here. Amen. Uh, almost, almost always. And so this, this morning's worship was extra sweet with you today. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of a, a piece of business, but it's an important piece of business. So on behalf of the elders, I'd actually like to take a few minutes to communicate some leadership adjustments that's happened on the ruling elder board. Um, but before I do so, I'd like to take a moment to explain, uh, to talk about our biblical understanding of elders here at SEC. We believe that eldership is a call upon a person's life, not just a job, but actually a call. Each of the elders of this church have responded to God's movement in their life. We're reminded of the text in 1 Timothy 3 that says, uh, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble thing. We believe that this is something that God does. And to become an elder in the church carries with it biblical responsibilities and demands a lifelong commitment to serve the Lord by shepherding brothers and sisters in Christ. Not an easy task. With that being said, it's important for us to communicate how we structure or organize eldership here at SEC. When we ordain an elder, we see this person pursuing a lifelong call of shepherding. These men are men of character and spiritual maturity, equipped and ready for the task of leading. And here at SEC, we have many elders um, who minister to this congregation. The ones whom you're most familiar with are those who sit on our ruling body of elders. These elders actively serve this body through prayer, vision casting, shepherding, and spiritual decision makings for this local church. We have people who have served on this board in years past and have since stepped aside from this specific role of eldership. However, we still consider these men elders, to be clear. They continue to pray, shepherd, and minister the gospel in wisdom and hope. Men that, that, has, that come to this church even to this day. And some who have gone to other churches and serve in other places. We do not unordain men whom God has chosen for his purposes. And we also do not limit the role of an elder to just the ruling board. So, to what I'm speaking about. Over the past several months, we've had three men, uh, wonderful, gifted men, Mark Dumdi, Jim Rockenbach, and Jay Johnson, 
who have stepped aside from the ruling board of elders here at SEC because of different seasons in each of their lives for different reasons. These men are still elders in this church. I want you as a church to hear that very clearly. They're still elders in this church. They're men of character, men of wisdom, men of prayer, men of leadership, and, ha and have an amazing value in providing spiritual care and advice to those in need of the body. However, each of these men have expressed their current desire not to serve on the ruling elder board of this church. We wanted to make sure that we communicated this movement to the church body as a whole as the elders continue to pray and seek the Lord to best shepherd each of you individually. So we wanted to inform you so that no one one day went, why do we not see that person on the ruling elder board? I want you to be clear, they are still elders. They're just not serving in that facet of eldership. Okay, let's pray and begin this morning. Father, we thank you and praise you for this morning, for the opportunity we have today to lift our heads out of our own situation and glance off and say, God, who are we to you? Lord, I pray today that your identity, your hope, your future, your focus would be brought to our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. And in this text, we ask, Father, for your work, your transforming work to be done in us today. We humble ourselves before you and seek your truth now. In Jesus' name, amen. I've been blessed over the years as a pastor to watch people hand their lives over to the kingship of Christ. I want to be clear, that's not just a pastoral duty, by the way. That's a Christian duty to share the gospel and see it happen. But being in the position I am, I've had a concentrated dose of watching people give their lives over to the Lord. Actually, at the beginning of this month, we celebrated with several who are in here today, we celebrated baptism as these people publicly and boldly proclaimed their commitment to Christ in front of everyone. However, also as a pastor, I've experienced so many who hesitate to give their lives to the Lord based on some complex situation that they're experiencing. I hear things like, pastor, if you only knew the sin that is in my past, if you only knew what I've done, you would agree with me that, that I couldn't give my life to Jesus. I want to be clear, you're not defined by your past when you come to the foot of the cross. Hear that very clearly. The cross is bigger than anything that has ever happened in your life. I hear things like, pastor, don't you understand the, or, or you don't understand the poverty or, or the abuse or the addiction or the worldview that won't allow me to accept Jesus as my king. And on, on the one hand, I respect someone who takes this decision very seriously. But on the other hand, I want to stand on the rooftops and I want to proclaim and shout out that Jesus is so much bigger than your situation could ever be. That Christ is so much greater than any circumstance or situation that that world could place in front of you. And I pray that in our text, I pray that in our lives, we come to the understanding, the conclusion of this truth. Now, I'm not minimizing anything. The power of situation, the power of circumstances cannot be overstated. We're all shaped to one degree or another by our immediate or past circumstances. But here's the thing, okay? No one single human being is in charge of situations or circumstances. Situations and circumstances, uh, they are created by millions of individual decisions by many different people. As individuals, we can manage situations, but ultimately each situation will change its course without taking into consideration at all our desire or how we feel. This is just the truth. Here's what I'm getting at. Many of us become believers we lay ourselves at the foot of the cross and we have an emotional experience or we, we come to a logical conclusion. But we all come to a crossroads in our life where we have to ask ourselves the questions, maybe more than once, 
We have to ask ourselves the question, are we thinking like kingdom of heaven people? Especially the kingdom of heaven people that Matthew's describing in this sermon on the mount. Are we thinking like the early parts of chapter five, people who live their righteousness as a light for all to see and glorify God? Or the second half of chapter five, are we living like people who understand that their righteousness has been filled up by Christ and activates the intended sanctifying work of the law? Are we thinking like people at the beginning of chapter six who understand how to live private righteousness, seeking the approval of God who sees what's done in secret? Well, Today, the major question we're asking as we reach this point of this sermon is is we're asking the question, do we have a Christ-centered perspective on life or are we simply situationally driven? Are we simply dictated by the circumstances that exist around us? And so I've come up with a few questions. We're gonna ask that flow through this task And we're gonna ask these questions and it's gonna be sort of a a test for you to to answer this question. Is my life Christ-centered or is my life situationally based in this world? And if so, how how do I get out of that? So let's go ahead and start asking these questions. And I I believe it works through the text in an order. And so we'll start here in verse 19 and 20. And the first question that I wanna ask is I wanna ask how far are you planning into the future? And you might say, uh, Pastor, that sounds like a financial planning question, okay? That's fine, take it as that, but let's, let's talk about scripture because it's not actually, it's a biblical question. So look at verse 19 and 20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth rust and, uh, and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal we see immediately that there's a contrast here, right? There's a contrast between what exists on earth and what exists in heaven. And this contrast has been one that Jesus has perpetuated from the beginning of the sermon. When he said, this is what the people of the kingdom of heaven looks like. The entire implication is that the kingdom of heaven is going to be defined and made up of people who think and act differently than those of the kingdoms of earth. And so this contrast is already set up in the text. But as we get to chapter six, we continue seeing the contrast set specifically about who's where, okay? Look at chapter six, verse one, we talked about last week. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. That's the realm here on earth. And before everyone else who's here around you. Be careful about practicing righteousness before them, for then you will have no reward from your father who is in heaven, right? There's this contrast of, of the one who fills heaven is the very hope of Christianity is that one day we will live eternally with him. And the idea is, is these are two different realms. And I don't want to draw this dichotomy too hard because I don't want to say that God is not here. I think the purpose of Jesus doing this is to say the believer, the kingdom thinker is one who has to set a focus, not here, but there. Has to set a focus there. As a matter of fact, as he teaches us to pray in Matthew chapter six, he says this, pray then like this. And he begins the prayer by saying, our father in heaven hallowed be your name. That our father who's in heaven, let's go ahead and get something straight. Our prayers are not about us. It's not about you and it's not about the earthly realm. As a matter of fact, as you continue in that prayer, it's, it's you know, our father who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth like it is in heaven. The whole goal is to say, let's focus our hearts on what is there and praise God for the fact that we get to experience that. That that dichotomy is already set all the way through this sermon, right? This sermon on the Mount. Well, as we get to this text, we notice that it's not just separating who's where, but it actually now is contrasting the difference between temporal, temporary, and eternal, right? That's what we see here. So look at... um, 
Look at verse 19 again. Do not lay up yourselves treasures on earth. He could have just stopped there and said, lay them up in heaven, okay? But he goes on to say, why? Why don't you store up treasures on earth? Because that's where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, right? Now, for us today, talking to, you know, you guys with all your technology and advancements in the world, you're like, what? Moth? We've got mothballs. It's not a thing. Like my, my possessions are safe. Rust? I've got this new spray that you can put on metal and it l- makes it last forever. No rust at all. And thieves, have you seen my shotgun? <laughs> or maybe I should say alarm system in the house. Have you, have you seen the way that I protect my things? Nobody's daring to come in here. I got this covered. But I want you to understand, first century readers, that these are unsolvable problems. I like how one commentator creatively tried to bring out the central meaning of this. And he said, moth could be nature's decay or corrosion. That rust is time's decay and corrosion. That a thief, maybe even more potently, is human decay and corrosion due to sin. That anything we build here is subject to decay and corrosion, period. And we have to know the temporal nature of what's going on. And then he gets to heaven and he says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither, and he goes through the negatives, no moth is there, okay? No, no rust exists in heaven. And guess what? There's not crazy people with sin all over their life because it's been dealt with by the cross and we exist in perfection with him. And so if you want to know what heaven looks like, it looks like no decay, no corruption, nothing that can steal the treasures that are stored up there. So just based on logic, if you want your stuff to last, don't do it here. I, I, this past summer, my wife and I decided, arbitrarily, that my son was old enough to watch the Pirates of the Caribbean uh, series with, with me. And you know, those movies, as you keep going, they get pretty dark. Have you noticed that? Like, like, I'm like telling my son, that's it. You know, like, that's the last movie. One day he'll find out I'm lying. But, uh, you know, the, the first one was fun, you know, but, but we kind of went through some of these movies. I noticed a theme, though. Like, with pirates, the way we celebrate them is always this hunt for treasure. Like, the X marks the spot. Here we go. Let's go on this treasure hunt, and we're going to find the treasure. But have you ever noticed that in all of these movies, when they find the treasure, do you know what is also there? The bones the bones of the other pirates who were searching for that same treasure and found it, who spent their lives trying to guard it and protect it. They decayed and died. I watched the Goonies when I was a child. I still don't know how my mother let me watch Goonies as a child. (laughs) I love you, Mom. I didn't know I was going to be looking at you when I said that. Um, (laughs) But I watched Goonies as a child. And here's the thing. Here's the thing with that is is they're looking for One-Eyed Willie's treasure and when they find it, there's one-eyed Willie holding the chest. Like, like, this is mine. And it's like, sorry, bud, you're dead. There's nothing here for you. It's temporary. It's on one level vanity and completely pointless. Proverbs 23 says it this way. Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it's gone. For suddenly it sprouts wings and flying like an eagle toward heaven. It's gone. The temporary nature of the treasure, it makes sense when you think about it. You see, true treasure is a reward that goes with us into all eternity. When we understand that this life is not it, when we understand that this life is not the the purpose. When we understand that eternity with the Father is actually the hope, when we get that perspective as kingdom people, then we begin to see that the only treasure worth pursuing is the treasure that transcends death. It's the treasure that transcends decay and corruption. There's no amount of money or gold that could count for more than the approval of our Father who is in heaven. 
So the natural question is, what is treasure? This is a little bit of an exegetical point. Uh, in the beginning, it says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures. We immediately think because of our pirates, uh, phobia or fetish, whichever one you've got, uh, the, the, because of the pirates thing and that we're all, we're all about, because of, because of that stuff, we think of treasure as gold or loot or some type of a thing. But don't miss the context of this verse. Surely it is talking about money in, in a way, because verse 24 is going there. But this is entirely in the context of what we've already talked about, approval. It's in the context of approval. And I think Jesus is making this contrast. I think he's saying the, the, the point I'm making is still about chapter six, what we've been talking the whole time, is that it's still about our natural desire to seek approval and to have the approval of the Father rather than the approval of men. And that actually, Jesus says, is our treasure. And it's greater than the money that's here. And I think even the pursuit of money, as we'll talk about in a second, but the pursuit of money is still to gain approval. It's for status. It's so that we might have a lot and that others might look and say, you've really made it. You're really here. So this is the, the tension that's being set up. Now, here's the deal. Kind of like we talked about earlier on or, or last week. Okay, we all have a driving focus, a, a goal of some sort uh, a treasure, whether that be uh, for you family, whether that be a bank account. I mean, let's just be honest with ourselves. You're, you're, you're the one asking this question about yourselves. But just like the beginning of chapter six, when Jesus said, said <laughs> when Jesus, <clears throat> that's on video. <laughs> First service on the website. Um, but even when Jesus said earlier on at the beginning of chapter six, when he, when, when he was going on the fact that, listen, your desire for approval is actually created by God. It's natural. I'm not trying to get rid of your desire for approval. What I'm trying to do is help you direct it. Direct it to the place where you will have eternal reward, not temporary, not temporary death. And he does the same thing here. Your desire to set up for your future, to think about your future, your desire to make sure that you, you need to know that you're safe as you, as you look toward the future, that desire is actually very normal. But it's in danger of being misdirected. It's in danger of being misdirected. We need to direct it to the right place. Jesus just wants to focus our future concern beyond this earth into eternity. So that the real question, back to what I was saying, the real question is how far are you planning into the future? Is it just to 65? Is it just to retirement? Or are you thinking like a kingdom of heaven person and you're investing in what cannot be stolen, cannot be corroded in this world? Some of you might say, well, pastor, I get that we're not supposed to be concerned about storing up treasures for ourselves. Okay, I totally get that. But that's not actually what I'm doing. You see, I'm storing up treasures for my children, right? That's good, right? Good selfless thing. I've got this big inheritance for my children. The kids in the room are like, dude, you need to shut your mouth right now. <laughs> like you need to calm down. I'm gonna let St. Augustine say what he says in regard to this very thing. He says this, it is a great duty of natural affection, it'll be said, for a father to lay up for his sons. But he says, rather, it's a great vanity. One who must soon die is laying up for those who must soon die also. The truth is, it doesn't matter what you store up and what you give to your children, it still will, will decay. It still will corrode. And, and, and the issue here. The issue here, it sounds extreme because he's all morbid with the death stuff. But listen to what he's saying. The idea is not only are we not finding our security in the dependency upon God because we're so concerned about storing up, but we're actually teaching the next generation to do the same thing. We're in danger of teaching an entire generation not to depend daily on the Father, but yet find their security and what's been handed down to them. 
As kingdom of heaven people, we plan for and seek our good pleasure in heaven, not here on earth. What, what, does, that, what does that mean? It means we think differently. It means our perspective has to change. It means that when circumstances or situations, by the way, that we cannot control, it means when that happens and they steal all the things that are able to be stolen. That means when a bomb goes off or something happens and World War III happens that we cannot control, that means that no matter what happens, they take your 401k. I don't know all the financial stuff, so I'm really struggling with, you know, making that connect here. But all the, all the things, no matter what, what can be stolen, what can be taken, what, what college fund is there or retirement fund is there, what can be taken, when it's stolen, we think differently as kingdom of heaven people. We don't walk in and shake our fists and go, why would God do this to me? Why would God take everything from me? Because when that happens, I'm gonna turn on my pastor heart. And I'm gonna look at you and I'm gonna say, I am so, so sorry. I'm so sorry that God sent his son, Jesus Christ. I'm so sorry that he stole everything from you when Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead to conquer sin and death. I'm so sorry that the veil was torn and you were given unfettered access to the Father through his blood and sacrifice. I'm so sorry that you've given, been given more in eternity than you could ever build up and possess here. There could never be more taken away from you, including your life, that could come close to equaling what has been given to you in eternity through Jesus Christ. That's just the truth. When kingdom of heaven people think and have a perspective of kingdom of heaven, king and life, that's what it comes down to. But we gotta keep going and ask our next question. Okay, so our next question is what are you focused on right now? Now this makes logical sense, right? This is common sense. Whatever your goal is in the future, you kind of go, yeah, okay, we get this question because whatever your goal is, is what you're gonna be doing right now, right? Whatever you're doing right now is gonna be working towards your goal. Yes, if you're an organized person. If you're not, you can end up a weirdo, uh, which, is, which is actually normal for most Christian lives. I was working on my sermon not too long ago and I met a kid uh, that was talking to me while I was working. And so I just kind of put my stuff aside and I said, hey man, let's talk. And so I asked him, hey, what are your goals? What are your, what are your hopes? What are your dreams in life? And he looked at me and he said, you, you seriously want to know? I said, yes, I want to know. Man, I want to be a doctor. Really? Yeah, specifically a surgeon. I want to be a surgeon and I just... <laughs> I love the idea of, of anatomy and being a part of, of really healing and helping people and really giving my life for this type of stuff. And I asked him some more questions. I was like, man, I'm really impressed. That's a phenomenal goal. So where are you in med school? Oh, I'm not. Oh, uh, pre-med somewhere. No, no, no. Actually, when I graduated high school, I didn't really want to study anymore and read. So I just got a job at Starbucks. It's been five years now. I'll go back sometime. And I'm going, okay, like conversation ended. I don't know where to go at that point. Like, okay, what you're doing right now has zero investment in the goal that you're stated. The, the only logical end is either the goal is a farce or a lie or we're completely distracted and unfocused in what we're doing right now. And I believe this represents so many of our hearts. So often Christians tell me, I'm in love with the Father. I'm looking toward heaven. I see that my hope is with him in all eternity. Yet every day they assign every point of their schedule to making the money that they can make. Anyway, let's read verse 22 and 23 really quick because this supports this question. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is, the dark, is that darkness? It's clear as mud. You guys, we can just leave. That, that, was, that just answered all of our questions. Now, I, there, is actually, there are actually a lot of grammatical issues in this, and I'm not going to dive into that. There was a, a Frederick Bruner, uh, I think, did a great job of saying 
that we can't answer this grammatically. We can't answer that, that but, but context has to drive what this text is saying. And so he made a really interesting suggestion. He said, switch the word I with goal and the word body with life, and you might grab a little bit of understanding of what's being said. And so it would read a little something like this. The goal is the lamp of life. If your goal is healthy, your whole life will be full of light. But if your goal is bad, your whole life will be full of darkness. Does that make sense? As you look at it in that light, you understand that future goals determine or dictate the, the present focus. And don't miss the hint in this is the other way. The other way is it is, it is important to guard your present focus in order to accomplish the goal because it's so, we're so easily distracted by the Lord of daily life, money. That's what verse 24 concludes by saying, no one can serve two masters for either he'll hate the one and love the other or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, period. The text couldn't be more clear. You cannot serve both. We can't set our future goal in heaven and then moonlight the current by working for money, by working to store up and depend and find our security in all the things that we can absolutely build. It's too common for people to give their lives to Christ and then prioritize themselves for the things that we need right now or that we need to provide for ourselves. I wanna be very clear about this, okay? Because I, I can already feel I'm gonna get in trouble by some of you for saying these things. I wanna be clear, okay? I'm not criticizing anybody who has wealth. As a matter of fact, I would say all Americans. I would say anybody in here, even the poorest person, is loaded compared to the rest of the world, okay? So, so put me in that category. I'm not criticizing anybody who has wealth, but I'd actually say that I believe that God has given your wealth to you, that it is the hand of God that has actually given it to you. However, I cannot relieve you and I cannot relieve myself, for that matter, from the contrast in the text of Scripture that warns against finding security in your wealth and even places a greater weight and burden on you to live lives of generosity. To live lives of generosity. Matthew doesn't lighten up on any of this. I'm going to stick uh, skip this text for right now. Uh, but Matthew doesn't lighten up on any of this. Look at Matthew 19 and how he speaks to the rich young ruler. He says to him, this is after the rich young ruler, by the way, comes to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, I have been obedient to all the commandments. I've done all of this. What do I need to do to enter the kingdom of heaven? Look, Jesus, look at all I've built. Look at all I have. Look at my superiority to everyone else. One of the ideas is Jesus coming, or this guy coming and saying, Jesus, you are lucky <laughs> that I'm your disciple or that I'm your follower. You're lucky that you've got me to follow you. Anybody feel like that in the room right now? If you do, get out. Um, <laughs> no, I, I'm absolutely kidding. If you do, let's pray. Um, but Jesus says to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give it to the poor. And you will have what we're talking about, treasure in heaven and come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had many possessions. This contrast isn't easy. I get people who will say to me, oh, brother Joseph, let's be very careful about this. Um, you know, it says in the text that the root of all evil is not money. It's the love of money. Okay, I just, I just wanna be clear about that, all right? So, uh, so that's the thing. Let me, let me be also clear. Jesus also sets the stage to say, and I'm putting myself in the same category. He sets the stage to say, if you have a lot of money stored up in a storehouse, by definition, you love money, okay? That's, that's the thing. The, the truth is, is we don't get out of leading generous lives, okay? Generosity, by definition, is all you have all the time. That's a, hard te that's a hard teaching for me. Generosity is all you have all the time. That's difficult. You see on these giving boxes around the room that we receive our tithe in, on the top of that says generosity changes lives. 
Okay, that's true. Generosity does change lives on the outside, but the first life that it changes is yours. It changes your life when you begin understanding the perspective of a kingdom person that lives with their hands open to the Lord. Okay, now before anybody walks out of here and says the pastor just told us to give everything we have to the church. No, okay, the 10% line item you got, that's, that's cool. That keeps our buildings running, it keeps everything going, but it doesn't free you from the biblical command of living generously until it hurts in your life that you find who needs it out there and you invest in them, that you find what needs to happen to where nobody knows and you give to them, that you give your talents and your, your, your life, that you find where you can invest in people and the kingdom and God's purposes and you give your life because generosity is all you have all the time, period. How in the world could we live like this? What if God called <laughs> This is where I'm gonna get in trouble, okay? What if God, and my Wednesday night people know this, okay? This is where I'm gonna get in trouble. What if God said, I have a need for this much money. Oh, look, it meets your exact amount in your retirement account. What if God said that? We would have a big check. God, that's my future. And God would say, is it? Is it your future? What if God said, hey, that savings account you've been filling, uh, here's an exact amount. Here's, here's what I'm asking you to do with it. And we all get a little uncomfortable, including myself. We get uncomfortable to have that conversation. But that leads me to our last question for this text. What are you anxious about? One click. What are you anxious about? Look at verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life what you will eat or what you will drink. Right after, he, right after he proclaims, don't serve money, live generous lives, live focused on the goal of heaven and, and live that way, he then says, and don't worry, about, don't worry about what's going on, okay? What you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll wear and what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? What are you anxious about? There's a couple observations I want to make about this text that are going to help us answer this. Okay, first of all, this entire text that states that God has a history of providing. Okay, like, like God just presented his resume, all right? He's like, resume's in, I'm good for it. Here's, here's my history of providing. Look around you. Okay, that's what he says right here in verse 26. He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, nor do they reap, nor do they do anything. But you know what? They're not worried. Why? Because I provide for them. Look at the flowers of the field. They're clothed in the most beautiful colors that Solomon can't even touch, even when he tried. And yet they're going to be alive today and dead tomorrow. Like the truth is you're worth more to God than all of those things. He'll feed you better and clothe you better. He'll clothe you to your needs and what he has. This is the second observation that I would say. God is intimately concerned about your needs. Listen, the reason I can make that statement boldly is because of what all, all I've already said. God is intimately concerned about your needs. If not, well, let me just say this way. I'm continually amazed and how many believers reduce themselves to simply deists? That God doesn't care. They step back, and I've heard this so many times. You know what? I, my problems are so small. God doesn't care about what I have to, to give to him. You know what? God, God doesn't have time to really deal with my thing. Well, who are you? Okay? The truth is, is God is sovereign and all-powerful. Like he's got a, like a fill-up bar? You know, and he's like, you know what? That's it for Tuesday. I'm done. I can't take any more requests. Your, your petty little thing? No, I'm not listening to that. I'm not saying it's not good to have perspective. That when we look and we say, we have brothers and sisters suffering in Africa, in Iran, in Iraq, and in China, that's important to have that perspective. But when we start thinking that God cares more about them than he does our situations or cares to take care of our lives, then we've separated ourselves from an intimate God. And everything that I'm preaching right now is impossible. Because if you are separated from an intimate God, from a God who knows every one of your needs, a God who is intimately concerned about every one of your needs, if you're separated from that, there is no way you can ever have the perspective in life to lean on him to take care of you. You will always trust yourself and yourself alone. And so the truth is, is that our God is intimate 
Look at verse 32. It says, for the Gentiles seek after these things, all the things to wear and things like that. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. Heavenly father knows exactly what you need. Don't miss that. Also, as a side note, don't miss that he says need and not want, okay? You can just do that and do what you want with that in your heart. But read verse 33 with me. But seek first, I love this, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Did you catch that? Who are my grammar nerds in the room? Grammar nerds, work with me, okay? At the very beginning of this verse, it says, seek first the kingdom of God. What type of verb is that? It's an active verb. That means the the agent, that means the one doing the seeking is you, okay? You're the subject of that verb. So it's, it's you seek the kingdom of God and righteousness. That's your job. That is 100% your job to seek it out, seek the kingdom of God and seek righteousness. But notice how it shifts. And all of these things will be added to you. Will be, what kind of verb is that? Future passive right? It's this idea that there's another agent. It's not your concern. You are not the subject. You're not the one doing it. It's that your job is to seek the kingdom and righteousness, and his job is to provide for you all the things that you could possibly need. God is the one who is acting on that verb. He's the one that will cause it to happen, and it's not your worry. Your worry is the kingdom and righteousness. And verse 34 sums this up. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is the day for its own trouble. Don't miss the Old Testament imagery in this. The idea that Israel comes out of Egypt and they say, God, what are we going to eat? And God says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to drop manna from heaven, right? And manna is a deep theological term. You know that, right? Very deep theological term. Do you know what it means in Hebrew? What is it? That's seriously what it means. They walked out and they go, um, what is it? I don't know. That's what it is. All right. We got some what is it here. Hey, I'm going to gather the what is it. You want some what is it? Like that's what manna means. They had no idea how to describe what God was doing. But what they knew is that it was provisions from the father. And he said, don't, don't collect more than what? one day's worth. Don't do it because tomorrow when you walk out, you don't need to worry about it because tomorrow when you walk out, guess what's going to be there? We don't know what it is, but it's there every day. And so that's the thing is that he says, don't miss that imagery. He says, that's the type of dependence upon God we're talking about. And he even taught us to pray that in the prayer. Our father was in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Not God, give us this year our salary doubled in the bank. I appreciate it. That's awesome, God. Some of us are praying like that, but that's awesome, God. No, the dependence is on him and on him alone. (laughs) Jesus is truly greater than your circumstances, your situation. He's greater than anything this world could put to us because Jesus deals in the realm of eternity and he's brought you with him. Just to close this, I wanted to read a quote from G.K. Chesterton, which I think is phenomenal. He says, there are two ways to have enough money. One is to acquire more and the other is to desire it less. How true. How true that is. When our lives become Christ-centered, we bask in the celebration of our eternal reward. And as a result, we loose our grip on the things of this world. And by definition, when we loose our grip on the things of this world, we become irresponsibly generous in following Christ. <laughs> I'm convicting myself. So we need, we need to pray. Man, the, the dependence on God, the fact that your situation does not dictate your faith and the truth that God is intimately close to you, And he wants you to depend on him for your every need. Three questions for you to continually ask yourself. How far in the future am I really planning? 
Is it eternity or is it here on earth? What am I focused on right now and is it supporting that? And am I being anxious, not depending on the Father for everything that I could possibly need? Those three questions will help us determine whether we are kingdom of heaven thinkers, whether we're kingdom of heaven perspective people, and whether we're glorifying him with every aspect of our lives. Let us pray as we close today. Father, we thank you and praise you for this text and even its difficulty. We ask, Lord, that you are glorified in us, that you fill us with hope. And as we worship and leave here today, Lord, I pray blessing over this congregation, asking, Father, for their eyes to be lifted up and without wavering, without uh, distraction, that they are focused on you and on your reward for them. I pray for this congregation that as we leave this place, that our hearts would be emboldened and strengthened, knowing that you are a God who cares, that you are a God who is here, that you are a God who has your hands wrapped around us and that we would let go of the life that we have built in the securities we think we have because, God, they're all temporal. You are eternal. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to give the Lord just a few more minutes of worship. Don't be anxious.